oh my god no this is so much this is great thank you annie thanks for your patience i got all day baby no i'm so excited to be talking to you i think this is gonna be fun yeah so yeah i want i want the thing i want to talk to you about most is alcoholism you it's it's a big part of your story (laughs) i i think you you've got a lot of, of humor in your your past al- alcoholism, but also I love your kind of arc of of how it led you to where you are now, and you know how how you getting sober also tied into you, your passion for comedy. Can you kind of give me the 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 play by play of like when was your first drink? When yeah. when did it kind of unravel and become out of control? What's that history? Well, I started, and I definitely agree with you that I think that alcoholism is a repressed trauma. Yeah. It's just a way to keep pushing it down and away and not deal with it. And for me, it was definitely like a self-hatred. So the first Mm -hmm. time I drank was I was in, my mother and I, I had been training for, I was a swimmer and I'd been training, had just started a swim team where I was going to train for the Junior Olympics. I was 12. And oh you were like super good. I mean, I had, I think I'm just very athletic. So my body is that build and I have ADD. Sure. So it's hard to focus on things. But I think if I had focused on it, I could have been a really good swimmer, which who cares? I mean, not that I'm like, I, what could have been? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. I could have been shaving my arms right <laughs> now. <laughs> Gliding through a pool. <laughs> but uh, I do have the shoulders for it. So. But, um, so my mom and I had gotten into a car accident on the way there. So it was my neighbor, her children, her son, and then another neighbor who were already a part of this program. It was about an hour away from my school or two hours away from my school. So they picked us up after school and they took, my mom was in the passenger seat. My neighbor was driving and then us kids were in the back. And we got in this really bad car accident with a drunk driver, which is so ironic that my drinking started from a drunk driver. And yeah. Fuck. So a drunk driver... Um, it was a woman who, a mom, you know, who was middle aged. I mean, she's probably younger than I am now, but I thought she, she seemed old then. And she drove, she was going to pick her kids up and she was wasted. And she drove into our lane and had a head on collision in her minivan with us oh on our way God. to the swim team practice. And we, I broke my foot. Uh, the guy next to me, his eye got, I mean, it was really pretty traumatizing the accident, but we ended up making money. We got money from the settlement and we went on a trip to Club Med in Mexico. Yeah. So I'm 12 years old at this point. i just gotten over my broken foot. I don't, I no longer, I remember having a choice to train again to swim and I just decided I didn't want to. I was like, I don't want to train. And instead I just started like smoking cigarettes and getting obsessed with boys. Why do you think you didn't want to go back to swimming? Or were you just... Did you not have a passion for it? Were you just burn out? I, what? Yeah, I just didn't really have a passion. I mean, I think I liked being good at things and I, you know, my parents would make me go, so I would go do yeah. it. And, but it just, I just got over it. I was like, I don't want to do hard work. I don't want to, I never really learned to follow through. Mm. <laughs> okay. Still, I'm still dealing with that. I'm like, I never learned the joy of finishing something. <laughs> I've never really, I'm pretty much addicted to my alcoholism is just now procrastination. I'm just addicted <laughs> to the negative feelings of not getting my work done. The suffering. Sure. sure. Okay. So then, so you go to this club med, med thing. Right, so we go to club med. And when I was there, my parents weren't really watching us. They had a kid's program and my parents just assumed that we were at the kid's program, but I was really off alone. I have two brothers. My brothers were off with some other kids and I kind of was off alone and we went to the there was this guy at the archery this like 26 year old guy whose name was Alex who worked at the archery place and he befriended me which I can't tell you how many oh grown men have befriended me in my life oh my god when my it's always so creepy when you look back when you're an adult and you're like why were all those fucking 30 year old dudes friends with me I was 12 like what's yeah, happening it's so it's like that movie beautiful girls where you're like how did this get made do you remember <laughs> no I don't where it's like Natalie Portman's a 13 year old. And, oh my and God. Like, all these people are like, she's so beautiful. We wish she was old. It's like, ew. Uh, uh, like old men. Yeah. It doesn't even work anymore. You're so nasty. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so we, so this guy, I, I started like hanging out with him at the archery place. And then one night he was going to walk me up to my room and he ended up walking me to his room. And 
he put on, what did he put on? He put oh, on I remember. Yeah, yeah like Journey Open Arms, which yeah, is yeah. not the creepiest song I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> and he started massaging my back. I'm 12 years old. I look like the middle Hanson brother. It's not like I was a hot 12 year old. I looked straight up like a boy. But I mean, Taylor Hanson was the hot one at least. <laughs> I wasn't, no offense to Isaac and Zach, but I was the cutest. And everyone thought he was a girl anyway. But anyway, so I was up there and I, you know, he just wouldn't let me leave until I made out with him. It was just so creepy and weird. And I don't know if I would have been drinking before that or right after that, but I remember yeah. going to the, to the, he had, it might've been before that, that he had invited me to the discotheque, the <laughs> dance at night. So I'm like getting invited by a 30 year old to go to a dance. I'm 12. My parents are just like, think I'm, I don't know where the fuck they thought I was, but I'm just off. And we we're in a resort, but we were still in fucking Mexico. I yeah. The fact that I haven't been sold into sex trafficking is almost insulting at this Astounding. point. Astounding. <laughs> I'm just so upset. I'm like, how did I not meet Epstein? But, <laughs> I mean, how did it not happen? Oh my God. But so, so, so yeah. then, okay, so anyway, so then I drank there. And I, I don't remember getting super drunk, but I remember drinking some Coronas and just being very normal. Mm. And then when that was I was your first time. That was very first time. Right. Yeah, that was my first okay. time drinking. Gotcha. And I didn't really have that much. Because my dad would have a little rum in his Coke and stuff. And yeah. when we'd sip it, we'd think it was regular Coke. And he'd go, no, there's adult stuff in it. That was my only knowledge of drinking. Nobody was an alcoholic in my family or anything. Okay. I wasn't around it. But then when I went back to school after that happened, oh, I got the guy fired too. I went, I freaked out. Good. I didn't really make out with him. I was, my parents knew none of this happened, by the way. They didn't know a thing about this. I where just, were, what were they doing? What, where were they? They were just, I guess, on their own vacation. I don't know what the hell they were doing. Were they like partiers? Were they... No, I think they were just like enjoying time off from the kids, but it wasn't really one of those types of vacations. Right. <laughs> they just right. assumed the adults were taking care of me. I think everyone was like, oh, somebody's got Annie. And I'm like, I think I'm, the person who's got me is a 26-year-old local Mexican man who we don't know his last name. <laughs> I don't know who this man is, but he no longer works there, I don't think. But I just remember going, because I realized how fucked up it was. It was so crazy that he made me make out with him. I just, I'd, I mean, I don't even know if I'd had a, I had kissed one guy at my Quaker youth retreats. Yeah. And you're like creeped out by him? You're, or are you thinking, you know, when you're at that age and you don't know, like, are you thinking, oh, I, I like him? Or are you thinking like, oh, this is wrong? What was your mindset? It was definitely both. It was yeah. like, oh, there's this excitement right. of attention from this man. And, right. you know, it probably goes back to my dad not paying it or something, you know, like some sort of, I, I, oh, male attention. This feels so good. Because mm -hmm. I'm so obsessed with my dad. I'm just like, all I want is attention from my dad. So <laughs> it's, it's got to be tied to that. But I was like, ooh, and I was boy crazy too. And he kind of looked young. So right. it was like, oh, I'm getting attention from a cute boy. I always, would always like imagine having a boyfriend. Like, oh, that'll be so cool sure. when I'm old enough. And so I'm getting attention, but I knew it was wrong too. I was like, this isn't a man, a grown man. And because he had lied to me and said he was going to take me back to my room. And then we ended up at his. Oh, I guess in my spidey God. sense, was like, why am I not? You just knew I something was wrong. wrong. Yeah. I felt like when he started touching me was when I was like, this is not a thing I'm ready for or want. Oh, I, the stomach, the feeling of like the knots in your stomach that, oh dear God. Mm -hmm. So then, so you get home and then you just start, where was home at this point? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And I was in a public school at the time. And I, I just started hanging out with the kids. My friend in middle school was yeah. just this really hot babe who was, turned out to be bipolar and was. They always really, are. Yep. Always, hundred percent. She lost her virginity before she even got her period. But I looked up to her because she was so pretty, and so she got all this attention from boys. Yeah. So I started hanging out with her, and then we were just these little baby sluts together, like just wearing backless shirts and <laughs> tons of makeup, and just so slutty, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just really overly sexualized, and and it wasn't. So we we would. We would drink and we would smoke. Like she smoked cigarettes, so then I became a smoker. And and I'm not saying she did this or anything, but it was it just I was leaning towards the darkness. The darkness felt good for some reason. I went, oh, this is where I should be. This is where I get the attention, and this is where 
I don't right. know. I, and do you trace it back to that? I mean, it sounds like you do trace it back to the, the incident in Mexico. Is that kind of being the thing that set you off? Because I feel like, you know, always comes, right? Yeah. There's like that point where you get to where you go, oh, that kind of was the thing that just. I, there's a lot of things that could have been because I have some memories of the same feeling I had with Alex in his room where it was like, I kind of like this attention, but it feels bad. The first time I remember feeling that was when I was four. And there was this guy who, oh, by the way, trigger warning for anyone. This is going to be all (laughs) really molesty. I mean, I like telling my stories to people. So I hope that everyone is okay, but I have no, I, you know, it's, I feel like I'm on this earth to tell, to tell these stories and, how and overcome them and tell people. I fucking think so too. As a fan, yeah. I'm like, I'm here for it. Go ahead. Well, I haven't, I don't know much about your one woman play or your one woman show, but the title makes me feel like we're very kindred. Oh yeah. Well, you know, you talk about like our upbringings were, are, I feel like are kind of opposite. You mentioned this, you know, this thing of like baby sluts and kind of your mom really, from what I've heard in your various interviews and things like your mom, not really being super present, just kind of letting you go off and do whatever you want. I had the opposite where my mom was just like overbearing to the point that we were completely enmeshed. I had no identity without her. I truly didn't, like my brothers would jokingly say as, you know, they'd be like, mommy, can I take a breath? Because that was kind of my whole, (laughs) she was my being, you know? But, But really like with the alcoholism thing, I trace that back to, I had my first drink two weeks before my mom died. Like wow. if that's not a fucking red flag, I didn't see it then. Like, it's so funny to me how much you get into denial with, with, with alcohol. Yeah. I just thought it was like, you know, I thought, Oh, I'm finally like growing up. I I'd always been this stunted emotion. Like, you know, you're, you, if you were a baby slut, I was the girl wearing children's place until I was fucking 15 years old. Like, <laughs> literally, Australia, I yeah. had this shirt that was a hundred percent totally cool <laughs> in sequins. It said across the chest. <laughs> that was what I wore for my middle school photo. So, so I was this very stunted person and I felt like I was just coming into my own and like, oh, I'm finally becoming an adult. I'm finally, you know, blossoming, but what a uh, justification. I I didn't realize what a justification it was until I finally started, you know, working on my shit and getting into therapy and and trying to resolve some of my past issues when I realized, oh no, yeah, I turned to whiskey two weeks before mom died. And then it just got out of hand after that. That was for sure, you know, for sure the, the inciting incident. Um, so, so, okay. So when was it that you realized like, oh, this might be a problem? What was the first, do you remember the first moment so, you had that? I, oh, well, let me finish what I was saying before. So yeah, I have yeah, yeah, memories go. of this guy, this old man that was, my mom worked for this organization called the Gray Panthers, which now sounds so culturally appropriated, <laughs> but <laughs> it's oh, about elderly God. people and they're, you know, uh, it was a uh, activism for el- the elderly and, uh, so my mom worked for this organization and one of the women, there was like an older woman that she worked with. She brought her husband over this guy, Jack. And whenever he would come to the house, he really liked me. He loved me. They're like, oh, you're his favorite, which it's like, why is a little girl an old man's favorite? Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember he always loved tickling me and would chase me around the house. And I was always a little bit excited that he was there and scared. And I have uh-huh. some memories that kind of go blank of getting mm-hmm. chased to a closet and stuff. So I think this mm-hmm. sexualization started young and that sort of wanting that male attention and stuff started young because tickling is kind of gross anyway even if oh my god when you, or when you say like the excitement mixed with the fear mm-hmm. uh, that feeling toward men i feel like is so common and not um, knowing the boundary uh, of what was appropriate or not uh-huh, uh-huh. so then okay so then i have that memory and then it also was a very my family i love my parents and i get along with them so well um the one episode you did about parents in the beginning, that disclaimer that your friend did, where he's like, yeah. I just want a disclaimer that I get along with my dad. I feel that too all the time. Where I'm like, oh, I want to also dis- the sure. disclaimer that my parents and I love each other and we really work on ourselves and That's we have amazing. a very good bond because you don't, <laughs> I feel guilty if I, I don't just smash them, but they were very verbally abusive when I was a kid. So very, very, I was, I had uh, problems with constipation when I was a kid and my, it was because I was lactose intolerant, but yeah. my parents were so frustrated and would just scream at me about it all the time. And it was just this thing that my body was doing. I was like, you know, a kid who knew. So I kind of got this message that I was bad mm. through that, that who I am and what my needs and my body and who I is bad. And I cause all this trouble for my family. So that I carried with me. And then the, then there's also the stuff with men. So I think both of those things 
were the perfect combination for me to be looking for a way to avoid myself. Mm. And I think drinking, I started young and it was a way for me to socialize and be cool with people and not be nervous. And so I would get right. Because when you're a teenager, you're so afraid to be yourself. Like, oh no, I hope someone doesn't see me be myself. <laughs> uh-huh. Oh God. We would smoke <laughs> cigarettes and stuff. And I would, I remember being high in my first boyfriend's basement and uh, sitting on his waterbed, smoking a cigarette <laughs> and all of our friends are around. And I lit the filter the wrong way. You know, I lit the filter instead of the front. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then being so embarrassed. Instead of just now, I would go like, oh my God, I'm such a fucking idiot. I look so wrong. We'd all have a good laugh, you know? <laughs> I thought, I smoked with with a guy to try to like impress him. I'd never smoked weed before. Uh-huh. And I, I like didn't inhale because I was scared of it. And I assumed that like being high looked the same as being drunk. So then I pretended to be drunk yep. <laughs> for an hour. And he called me out on it later. We, we were together for a while. And he was like, what was that? And I was like, oh, I was trying to impress you. And it was... So Isn't it unbelievable how, and you always incriminate yourself, wor- like you always yes. put yourself in a worse position. Yes, yes. Every time. I remember I had, I worked at a, my first job was at a Color Me Mine, one of those pottery painting places. Sure, sure. And I was 15 or 16 and everyone else was, you know, 19 or 21 or something. So mm-hmm. I would try to be cool with them. And I remember like, what kind of music do you like? I'm like, I love Led Zeppelin. I'm like, what's your favorite Led Zeppelin song? And I, and I to be cool, instead of just going, I don't know the fucking names of the songs, right? Which is, <laughs> why do I need to know the names of the song? Yeah. And I just feel the music. I go, um, <laughs> I go, I love the song, You Don't Have to Go, which is named Dire Maker. And I just remember, and he goes, you mean Dire Maker? And I went, oh, and I like melted and probably, <laughs> you probably could have glazed one of the fucking ceramic teddy bears with my <laughs> I was just like not as a puddle I was so embarrassed but I could have just been hey I'm 15 dude I don't know the fucking name of it <laughs> you know it's just, it's just being yourself I think that's definitely a lesson that's taken me so long to learn but anyway yeah, so, so yeah so I started smoke oh and then so I cut the filter off in the basement I cut the filter off with I had a Swiss army knife on my keychain. So instead of just admitting it, I fucking tried to, I sneakily cut the filter and then smoked it regularly. Like I did all this secret work to try to just keep from people noticing that I smoked it. <laughs> so, so my parents sent me to a school that was for juvenile delinquents and for kids with learning disabilities. So I had a little Why did they send you there? What was the... I wasn't doing great in school. Okay. I don't think I was actually doing that bad. I honestly think my parents had a weird view of me that I was worse than I was. But I, you know, I was hanging out with that friend, which wasn't, yeah. she wasn't really a great influence. And then I have a twin brother and an older brother who just were a little bit behind me in being bad. Like they eventually got caught throwing their parties and stuff. But for some reason, mm-hmm. it was like, I guess a little bit more of the age that they were expecting it or they were already used to it from me getting into trouble that. It didn't read as them being bad it or worn off a little. Yeah, right, right, right. Even I'm like, it's pretty much the same thing. I just <laughs> you just put me in very weirdly dangerous situations. <laughs> I don't think they knew how to raise a girl. I think that was a lot of it too. Yeah, sure. We're more emotional. We're and not that. I mean, I know so many guys that have been molested and stuff, and I do think that that predators just prey on what's there, mm-hmm. what they can get. Mm-hmm. But I do feel like they just didn't know that I was a beautiful little girl that could be, they just didn't know that that was what was going on. So I ended up, I don't, I guess I just didn't like public school. I didn't feel paid attention to, mm. I didn't, I wasn't doing my, I don't know. My mom was always writing my papers too, by the way, which is a very weird thing. Really? Yeah. In fifth grade, I handed, or sixth grade, I handed a paper and the teacher called me the desk and said, why does this say Abigail Letterman on it? And I was like, oh, uh, <laughs> my mom typed it. She wrote a fucking name. It's like a weird psychological thing in my life that happened. My yeah. mom wrote my papers until I was, till my last four in college. Oh my God. Their whole life she wrote my papers. And that's so weird. That's wild. Yeah, it's really weird. And then we definitely huh. have uh, had some, been at odds about that. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But so... 
I don't know. It's just a self worth thing. I, I I thought I was a piece of shit. I got called really bad names when I was a kid. I yeah. wasn't excelling in school because I had ADD and it was you know maybe I needed a little extra attention. I wasn't getting it. And right. Instead of learning how to get work done, my work would be done for me. So then I didn't learn the joy of finishing a project or feeling good about yourself. Hmm. So I just started to really hate myself. I just really was like at my core, I'm bad. And I think that's where the drinking was because I drank a lot. I went to this school. I just went there. It was a school that you're supposed to get kicked out of another school to go to. And I just went there. (laughs) (laughs) And then, so I went from being sort of bad to being immersed in this. The worst. Yeah. Yeah, So then I'm being influenced by these people. Everyone I'm hanging out with is, you know, burnt their school down or did something crazy. Yeah. And it just made me even, you know, even worse. But I always felt like I was like the good friend, at least. I always thought like I was the one that had a little bit more, was more morally conscious. <laughs> sure, sure. But maybe not. Who knows? So anyway, so then we, what happened? So then I started drinking in high school. And then I was, I got, we had a teacher, my art teacher, who was this white guy with dreads, which, you know. It's just, you should yes. see the warning signs. When the warning signs are there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but so he and his wife, they both worked at the school. And the school's name was Krefeld. I always take out the name because I I don't know why, but the school's name is Krefeld. It's still running. But um, this teacher ha- would start to buy us all weed and alcohol and be like, come over. So we would all go over and party at this teacher's house. Oh, my God. And the school had pillows instead of chairs. Like it wasn't, it was not a real school. I didn't read, I don't think I read one book in high school. <laughs> it, it's not like a theater. It's not like a performing arts thing. Nope. Like it was just, so weird, man. Okay. And, you know, and my parents were always like, yeah, but you never would have graduated if we didn't send you there. And I was like, what are you talking uh, about? Yes, I would yeah. have. <laughs> what, bitch, you would have read all my papers. Of course I would have. But, um, <laughs> but it just, it's so funny. But anyway, so. He so they started kind of grooming us and having us come over and stuff. And then my they convinced my parents to let us sleep over. So then it was like me and my one girlfriend would sleep over at these And your parents aren't saying, wait, what? To Well, my parents are like, This is great. (laughs) They gave them a futon. Oh my God. Yeah, it's really weird. I mean, the weird thing is my parents love the shit. I mean, we I talk to them every day. It's not they just didn't. I well, no, I, mean, I, yeah, I want to hear about that too, how you got there, but okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel like they just didn't, they're very, I don't know if it's low self-esteem or something, but like, oh, we shouldn't have good, nice things. Like, let's give our nice things away. And I just happened to fall into that category of one of their nice things. It's like, it's like the martyr didn't, I mean, like my mom was definitely that way. She'd always be like, I only have one bra. And it's like, well, get another bra. But she loved that she only had one bra. So that's yeah. what she always had, you know? I have three swimsuit tops. I have, <laughs> I have zero bras. They're far set, my boobs. They're far set. I, I can't find, it looks weird if I wear a bra. They get squished in. <laughs> Okay, so this guy, this guy is inviting you over, you and your classmates over. He's yeah, giving you weed. He's like weed. grooming us, doing all this stuff. Then yeah. all of a sudden, there's a futon. We have our own room, and then my my friend can't sleep over one night. And the way they convinced my parents, I said, "This will be good for you because when when they go, when she goes off to college, you'll have sort of broken your ties with her a little bit. You'll have had time off, so it won't be so weird when she goes to college." I'm like. <laughs> looking back on that that's the crazy but they just groomed everyone they took advantage of everyone mm. in the situation the predators yeah so I was sleeping at the house one night and Debbie the female teacher the wife she wasn't there so it was just me and Greg we also called the teachers by their first names at the high school which is like <laughs> another red <laughs> another flag. Red flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah you know when you call them by their last names to sort of put a boundary and go hey sure. I'm not supposed to fuck Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. Jones says not to try, not supposed to try to finger me in gym class. But <laughs> so anyway, so we, mm-hmm. one night he comes, I'm sleeping and he comes in and I wake up and he is watching me sleep, which oh. is so scary. He's come into my room. He's laying on one of his elbows and he's just facing me and staring at me. 
Oh my God, and the I only thing more creepy would be if he like put his finger and just, just, you know, swept your bangs out of your face. I know. I mean, it was, cra- I mean, he probably had a boner. I mean, who knows? Oh really God. Crazy. So then, um, <laughs> sorry, I told this story sometimes that I, I literally can't stop laughing about it. But um, it's just, he had, how dare he have dreads? But so then I wait, I'm like scared. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? You weirdo. Ew. Get out of here. And then the next day, his wife called, and I was like, Greg's weird. He just, I woke up when he was, and he was staring at me or something, and she was like, put him on the phone or something like that. Okay. And I remember that happening. And then he goes, oh, also, they had, would have all of us over, and we would all get naked. I forgot to tell you this part. No. Part of the process, we would all get naked. And how did that even start? Was somebody just like, one person takes off, he takes off his clothes, and then he get, how do, like, how do you get, I were, this is, if I think about what it was, I think what happened was Debbie, the, the female teacher, was in the bathtub. Yeah. And Greg, her husband, sent me and this other girl in and was like, why don't you go take a bath with her? Oh, no. And we were like, uh-huh. like it's like this weird, it's so crazy. I mean, <laughs> mm. so crazy. Yeah. Um, but I'm very, I feel like I'm actually, I actually look at my life like I'm very lucky. Very lucky. Because of what, how do you? I mean, what could have happened. Also, I have, my life is, I could scream off the mountaintops. I'm so in love with my life. I'm so That's happy amazing. and so grateful that I'm where I'm at. So I, I don't know that if I wasn't, if it wasn't built on trauma after trauma. And my trauma response is to tell jokes, so. Right, right. You know, and so in a way it really helps you to yeah. become more of who you are. Right, right. No, I'm I get you. So glad I quit drinking. And I think if th- this the first time I quit drinking was after all this happened. So they would have us get naked, okay. all this weird shit. So anyway, so then he said to me after when we were alone in the in the house, he was my art teacher. So he was like, Can I draw you nude? He's like, I've all these wasted naked bodies. And I was like, uh and I remember I didn't want to do it, but I felt like my friend would do it and I felt like I'd be uncool and I would be accusing mm-hmm. him of something if I said mm-hmm. no. Mm-hmm. I mean, how crazy is that? I was afraid I'd be accusing him of being a pedophile by saying no to this pedophilic thing he wanted to right. do. Right. No, I, I totally get the, the mindset. Yeah. I get it. So I get naked. I leave my socks on. I get naked and he ends up sitting on the back, on the back of my legs and jerking off into my knee pit. <gasps> I had like on my like thigh and knee pit uh. area, I had like jizz. Oh my God. And I'm like, holy shit. Are you saying anything while this is happening? What are, what's in shock? Completely in shock. Totally shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Just filled like adrenaline, like, like I couldn't believe it was happening. Yeah. And, um, and I had to go to work at Color Me Mine. So I remember just pulling up my little like old Navy khakis, you know, and being like, I gotta go to work. And just like not even wiping. I didn't even wipe the, I just like, pulled it, my pants over because I was like, mm-hmm. didn't want to even acknowledge it happened. Mm-hmm. And then I went to work and I talked to one of my coworkers who they were all older. So I told him and he was like, oh, that's the most fucked up thing I've ever heard. He's like, that is really bad what that guy just did. Mm. And I told some of my guy friends and they were like, that's why we, I had this one friend that would never go over and party with the teachers. And we were like, why won't you come? And he's like, it's weird. He's like, I told you it was weird. <laughs> right. But so anyway, so I, throughout this time was started to realize what happened and how bad it was. And, you know, the drinking and the drugs used to happen at that house. So after I ended up going to court, I went to the teachers, I did a whole thing. And if you want to hear more detail on this, which God bless you, if you do, um, you can hear my Marin because I don't need to tell all the stories because it's getting off track of the drinking, but no, sure. sure. um, The Marin's great. But so I ended up going to court and it was really a very painful experience. And, yeah. Really traumatizing. Possibly the treatment after what happened was worse than what actually happened. And now later on, I realized that uh, a lot of the teachers had done stuff like this to other students. And one of the teachers, our science teacher, just got busted for kitty porn like three weeks ago. You're kidding. Yeah. One of the teachers that I thought was good. Like I thought back and I went, oh, he at least disciplined us and he had, you know, the respect enough to punish. Us. Like he was the one teacher that was would would um, you know, give us detention and stuff. Mm. And then I'm like, even fucking him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. They found 
kitty porn in his house, or I guess he's accused of it. Oh, God. But they found all this kitty porn infant to 16 years old or something crazy. Uh, I, this is a sidebar, but I just have to know, with, doc, with like the, the Epstein documentary, are you able to watch things like that? Or is it, su- like with the trigger, with things that have trigger warnings around them, right? Sexual abuse, anything like that. Are you able to watch or is it just too traumatic for you? To- it depends because yeah. I do. Wa- I did watch the Epstein thing, and I do get really interested in this stuff. I part of me yeah. feels like I'm supposed to be the next Chris Hansen or something. <laughs> like I'm supposed to be catching predators. Yeah. I, I really Come sometimes on, like this. That's what I'm on this earth for. Like, what is going <laughs> on? And so I do watch a lot of Chris Hansen, and I watch a lot yeah. of that sort of stuff. And and the Epstein documentary was interesting to me because I. You know, I was the age of those girls, so I understand yeah. that. And, you know, all these arguments, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in comedy, too. And people mm-hmm. are like, well, if a girl's 17, but, and I'm just like, ugh, you guys are so gross. Because mm-hmm. they're always looking at it from the guy's point of view. Mm-hmm. Right? Oh, like, they're my God. Going, they're always going, well, she was, it was legal in that state or whatever. Uh-huh. I'm like, the reason it, the age of consent is legal is 16 in some states is so they can go to the prom with their 18 year old boyfriend not so they can go with your 40 year old ass like dear god thank you Fuck and yeah. think about it from the imagine you're in class you're in high school you're in geometry class mm-hmm. and the girl you want to go to prom with is like i can't go to prom with you my 40 year old boyfriend won't let me you would go ill you're being molested you wouldn't go yeah right. i'm so glad that that guy knew that the law in this state mm-hmm. is <laughs> you know I mean? oh my god no my first relationship i was it was a uh, i barely i think i was 18 and he was 34 33 34 yeah. and at the time i thought i really thought like oh it's because i'm so mature and like oh <laughs> it's because i am like on his level and i could never be with somebody my age it was coming from such a self-righteous place that, and then, you know, I hit, when I hit 25, I was like, oh, that's fucking weird. I'm 25 and I couldn't imagine being with a 21 year old. Yeah. Let alone 33 and 18. Like what was going on? Oh, it's so, it's, it's so, so weird. weird. I mean, it's what's happened in your youth. And, yeah. and yeah, it's just, it's just so weird. And it's so frustrating because it's the adult's responsibility to be the adult it's so frustrating Mm -hmm. well she looked older yeah but just imagine what she actually is let her be her age stop trying to make Mm -hmm. her older so you can stick your dick in her they're so (laughs) gross god it's so weird it's just like yeah think of and even when the thing that is triggering what you were asking about with the epstein documentaries and all these things Mm -hmm. like i didn't watch the the r kelly one the r kelly one bothered me because all of the promos for it were like you know, the commercial breaks would be like, come after the commercial break to see, you know, so-and-so run off set. They ha- would have them like crying and running off set as mm. the promo. I'm like, you're exploiting these people. Completely exploiting that. Yeah, yeah. I just know that it doesn't help the victims. When these things ha- come out, it doesn't help them. Well, that's what I'm wondering with all, because sexual abuse is such a fucking, you know, quotes, hot topic right now. That's like, how do, how is the conversation going to actually move forward? And when do you know whether it's moving forward or just exploiting the trauma of these young girls. So, you know, the yeah, Epstein totally. thing is just like, oh, well, and however many views and it's, it's such a, I don't know, it's, it's pretty convoluted. I, I, well, they never focus. Nobody gives a shit about the victims. They like okay. the idea of feeling that there's victimhood. There's something just so weird happening right now where being, there's, there's like, I don't know how to say it without well, just there's like a, a currency in victimhood, but not mm-hmm. real victimhood. If you really, really were hurt, mm-hmm. like people don't want to go there. They're like, ooh, that's a lot. So we'll just focus on Epstein and oh my God. whoever, because it's too real what happened to them. So they don't want to go into that. But if you feel like you've, you know, someone treated you a little bit sexist or something, then you can run with it. Because it's like, mm-hmm. well, that's not too big of a, that doesn't really need Ah. a real change because it really to me when I look back on the stuff that happened to me in high school and when I went to court and I really was let down so hard by so many grown-ups and the reason they Ah. did it and the betrayal that I always think about is that you're told when you're a kid to tell the truth they go do the right thing tell the truth but they don't mean it 
Mm. So many times what they mean is do the thing that's going to be the most comfortable and easy and going to get us fucking through this. Oh mm-hmm. my God. Yes. Oh, and right? I, wow. Yeah, so yeah, then yeah. I had to go stand on my own and stand up to this teacher and be like, what you did is not okay. And I thought it was just him. Up until recently, I thought my issue was with this man, that there was this one predator. But what I realized was I was in an establishment and they may be a better school now and not be like that anymore. Um, but they, there were, there's so, it was such a small school. My graduate class was 17 kids. And from talking to other students, the stories that I've gotten, a lot was going down in that school. Mm -hmm. And I went to court and some sort of settlement was reached where there's no record of this anywhere. Like, I don't know where the record is. I'm trying to find the record of this. How did that that happen? I don't know. My parents, I think, just did something to end it. Like, just like, what can we do to make this end fast? Go away, right. And it was traumatizing, and I'm sure they were trying to look out for me or whatever. But for me, looking back, I'm like, I went through this hell, and then where is the story about it? (laughs) Mm. Like, what, you know, the teacher ended up getting three years probation, and I think he can't teach in a high school anymore. And after my Marin, people figured out who it was and they wrote me and they said that he was about to start working with at-risk kids again. And they, they blocked Stop. him because they heard my, my thing. It's like people target, they, they prey upon at-risk kids. And I mean, uh-huh. as a child care, I'm sure you have a lot of friends or whatever crazy shit. It's like you, they were preyed upon. Oh my God. Oh my you God. Know? Yeah. And, it's, and it's like, where, you know, you look at it and it's like where it, there is no care for the victims. And I'm not saying I regret coming out. I'm glad that I stood strong and yeah. this person at that age and was able to do that. But it was really hard and it was the aftermath that was the hardest. It was the people calling me a liar. and But it doesn't matter. Like I knew I was telling the truth and it's all good. And I just think that everyone, it's easier to blame a victim or to kind of roll your eyes in that situation because it's, you don't have to do any work. It's just that one one bad egg rather than there's this whole mm. thing that needs system to be system of yeah, right system of. no it's i mean that gets me thinking too to some of the stuff that you're talking about even in in the rogan of uh, rogan episode of like uh victimhood and how like when you're talking about kind of the anger and that you could go one of two ways of either like blaming everybody around you or sort of taking responsibility that's something that really resonated with me it's a lesson that I have had to learn and continue to try and learn. But there is still part, a part of me that does get really fucking angry about mm-hmm. past situations. And I mean, I get like right now talking about it, my face gets hot. My yep. eyes just you start welling. It's just like, there's a, a part of me that just thinks, no, that's fucking unfair. Yeah. Like, how did these people get away with this shit? It boil, you boil uh, up, right? I can feel like boiling water rising through yes, my body, like from my yes. face all the way to the top of my head. Oh but my I've God. really worked. I've really worked on breathing that away. I was in a situation, I was writing on something and we had this expert come in to talk about some sort of sexual assault thing. And as she was talking, I just started boiling. Mm. And I just, I remember just breathing it down and being like, holy fucking shit. Like I am growing up and how good does that feel Mm. to learn to manage your triggers? Because we're all like everyone's had fucked up shit happen, right? Yeah. And if you don't, and I may have said this on Rogan, but if you don't handle your triggers, you are just an unsheathed sword, just slicing everyone around you. Yes. Oh my god, that hit me in my heart when you said that. Ugh. Yeah. Just put. You can just sheathe that bitch. Just sheathe it. And I really, I've done a lot of work. I do this thing when I'm triggered. Now I've, yeah. I've been talking about it on my podcast and with my patrons and stuff. It whenever I'm triggered, I say I'm twiggled. Because <laughs> you bring it to the age that you're being, you know. Right. Remember, you're being a kid. Yeah. And I'm twiggled. <laughs> I'm being a twiggled little baby. <laughs> and oh, yeah. really like it really helps me be like, all right, bitch, you're grown up. You can handle this. You got you. You don't need help. You can help yourself. No, that's amazing. I love. I love when you when you find little tools like that you know, like the, like the twigger, twiggered, or for me, like, <laughs> for me, it's a, I all say like, oh, my diva bitch is coming out when I'm starting yeah. to get really angry and heated about something. And it's so stupid, but helpful, like to have that yeah. separation and go, oh, this is a thing. I don't, for me, I'm able to observe it in a way that I'm not when I'm just like in the thick of it and feeling the, the boiling water and feeling the emotion. Isn't it funny that we're taught to not be divas too? It's like, shouldn't we be fucking total divas? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we be like it's so funny it. all the stuff that's happening to Ellen and I'm like 
Yeah. It seems sexist. <laughs> Honestly, it seems sexist. I've heard rumors that she's like a bitch or whatever, and she's hard to work with and stuff. But I'm also like, yeah, but she's also this lesbian who broke ground, did all this stuff. So you guys are just going to cancel all this amazing <laughs> shit she did because she's cranky when she's offset or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I try to treat people nicely and I've definitely been treated like shit by people, but I also am just okay. like, she fucking has done a lot. I mean, she dresses like a man and dances crazy <laughs> and wi- and straight women eat her up. <laughs> it's like amazing what she's done. I'm just like, I don't know. I mean, but also I've been treated like shit by people, but I just don't, you just can't take it on. Everyone's taking everything on and taking everything personally. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I feel like right now. No, but yeah. Anyway, sure. so the drinking, how the drinking ties into it is I stopped drinking after all that stuff happened in high school. Stopped. I stopped drinking. I quit okay. drinking at first, the first time I quit drinking, I was 16. Cause I was like, I need to like oh, I be know. Okay. present. Wow. That's, and, that seems like a lot of, that's, that's impressive to be 16 and go, Oh, I'm going to stop this. Dude, I was so impressive. When I look back, I'm so proud of myself. I'm like, I can't fucking believe what a badass I was. I yeah. did so much on my own. And I never, because I was blamed myself up until, you know, three years ago, maybe even four years ago, I always blamed myself and thought I was bad. I never was able to see that I was a fucking rock star. Mm. I was so strong and so good. And not only... And I guess I was afraid to blame my parents. I was afraid to, because I love them so much and I yeah. don't want them to do that. And I want them to be these perfect heroes, but they're not. And nobody is. Everyone's a flawed person. Everyone acts out of their own inner child bullshit and their own triggers and patterns and stuff. And so now that I've accepted responsibility and I realize that I'm not bl- like, I'm not like, fuck them. They suck. I, now I'm able to look back on myself and go, oh, I was strong. I overcame. I stood up for myself. Mm-hmm. I took the lessons, even if they didn't mean them. I took them and I, and I help people not have what happened to me happen to them. And then now I get to forgive my parents and I get to forgive the people. I forgive my teacher even. I've done a bunch of, I do a lot of breath work and visualization stuff. And I, can we talk about this? Because that, that was yeah. another thing when you mentioned the forgiveness that is, I mean, I gotta be honest, like I really struggle with forgiveness. It's a thing for me that just, it's like, is, is there a point that you get to where you go, Oh, I think I realized that I've forgiven. Or is it just something like, is there an end point with forgiveness? Do you feel like a completion on your process in your process of forgiveness? Or is it just something that you can continuously have to revisit and keep in check and maintain? I, it's a, I think it's a maintaining thing. And, huh. but there's an overall arcing, like universal forgiveness. And I've done a lot of work on myself and I've done four ayahuasca ceremonies that I really credit a lot of my growth to. Cause it was, ayahuasca wow. is very much like having 30 years of therapy and really six hours. It scares me. Okay. It, I mean, it's the most beautiful thing I've ever done really? in my whole life. And yeah, I, I'm, I look forward to doing it again when, when wow. the world allows. <laughs> right, right, right. But it really is just, for me, it was just a really, it was, it's this medicine that you can take, this, this liquid that you drink. And I have a shaman who's amazing, really kind and helps guide you and stuff. But it's this, you know, this medicine that you take and then this woman Mother Ayahuasca, people call her. I know this sounds so crazy, but I just, I wouldn't believe it if I didn't do it. But she comes to me and then she helps me find answers. And I'm just left with this overwhelming feeling of just pure love for everyone, you know, and just so grateful to be here and so grateful for all the things that have happened to me because they've led me to be who I am. And it's so, it's, you know, I'm really, how old are you? 20, uh, just turned 28. I'm so, I'm so proud of you. You're like doing this so young. It's so. Oh, thanks. It's, doesn't it feel so good to work on yourself? Your whole podcast. I love the whole idea of it. Oh, thank you. It's just so good. It's such a good thing to be doing. Well, I, it, it, you know, just with, with some of, of uh, you talking about like the self-hatred and stuff, that's, I realized a lot of that was coming up for me with, after my mom died, it was just like, mm-hmm. I mean, it was three years of complete hell and chaos and cost. I mean, I fell into like deep, horrible bulimia and, and horrible relationship with alcohol and 
just, you know, the unsheathed sword thing that you mentioned, that mm-hmm. was how I felt at all times. I was hurting people that I loved and, and, you know, just doing, behaving in ways that I didn't, I didn't have any, any sense of, of, um, I guess really no self-esteem, no confidence. Yeah. I didn't know what to do without my mom dictating my identity. I was lost. And then I, I don't, you know, just got to a point where it was like too much. Like this is, yeah. I mean, it was honestly, it was not sustainable. I didn't know where I was going to wind up. You know, I'd be drunk in the middle of a street in, in France doing a, I was supposed to do a press junk the next day. I got completely wasted. I'm literally sitting on a curb and a friend of mine calls me and I, and he tells, explains to me how to drop a pin, stays on the phone with me till I get back to my hotel in a cab. Cause he wants me to be safe and knows that I'm fucking passing yeah. out in cabs. It's like, what was I doing? <laughs> what was that? It's, it's I mean, such it's, an escape. It's like a smoke break uh, yourself. That's what I was yeah. saying. Like, it's like, God, I got to get away from this because you, you somehow learn that you're bad. And the enmeshment thing is so serious too. Mm. I dated a guy who was so fully enmeshed with the mom. He was so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I'm calling you crazy, but <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. every end we really do. It's just the fact that we all kind of get fucked up no matter what we're given. It just lands on us in a way mm. that even the lightest trauma can can land really hard on other people. Right. It oh, really, yeah. That that I think has helped me with forgiveness too. But it's so the craziness of like getting blacked out, dude. I would get so drunk. I would get so blacked out. And then we're leaving ourselves. We, ha- we can't protect ourselves. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. can't have, and then anything can happen to us. And it's, you know, I always, it's always hard when, when, you know, a lot of these like college rape cases come out and, and everyone always argues, they go, don't victim shame the girl for being drunk. And it's like, it's not victim shame. It's mm-hmm. like, there we have to like, be aware of our surroundings at all times, not because guys should be allowed to behave badly or whatever, but just because we are our only protectors. We are the only ones that are with us at all times. And if we lose ourselves, we lose ourselves. We mm-hmm. are, you were lost in France. Mm-hmm. I woke up on park benches, like in a, I bought a, I woke up in a swim, a bikini once in the middle. It was like December in fucking New York. I'm in a new bikini. I'm like, where am I? It's freezing. Why do I have a swimsuit on? Like, what? The, I had a black eye. I was like, what happened? <laughs> oh my god! I mean, did just like, I, did you ever? <laughs> I did figure it out. My okay. ex-boyfriend and his wife came into town. Twiggle, okay. twiggle, <laughs> and all of my college friends were hanging out, and we had gone bar hopping, and I got blacked out within the first bar or two, and we were wandering around New York, and they had a hotel, so we went to. American Apparel, and I know it was American Apparel because my ex-boyfriend's wife posted the most hideous picture of me in a bikini with like all my Jaeger weight on. I forgive her. I forgive her. <laughs> I forgive her. But so I had gone and I had bought a bikini so we could go to their pool. I went to their pool. They said that I refused to get in and curse them all out, which is so funny. And then I walked into a door. I guess that's where I got the uh, black oh, eye. And then I like threw darts at a dog. I mean, I woke up in someone's house that I hadn't seen in five years since yeah. I'd been in New Mexico. And I was like, Carlos? Like, what? <laughs> it's just like, what? And I, I just, you know, these experiences were kind of funny to me the next day. I would call everyone and be like, you're not going to believe what I did. Oh my God. Isn't that the truth? I had a gynecologist appointment at like eight, like some ungodly <laughs> hour. I was still drunk. Like I had, you know, I was drinking till like six in the morning. I go to, I show up to the gynecologist. I have my feet in the stirrups. She's got her hands in my vagina and I'm just like taking pictures and sending them to my friends. What was I doing? <laughs> like, why did I think it's just so I cannot I we're very kindred. How funny. Oh my God. <laughs> we're kindred. I remember going to a gynecologist when I was like at the height of my drinking. I was living in New Mexico. And I went to this gynecologist because every day I woke up thinking I had herpes. I would have no <laughs> and by the way, if you have herpes, that's okay. I'm not shaming you. But I woke yeah. up every day with the fear of herpes. Mm-hmm. I would be like, I have it. And I would go, and the lady's like, you don't have any symptoms, honey. Like she was like, I'm <laughs> crying in stirrups. I'm weeping. I'm so chubby. I'm literally filled with yogurt and jizz for the brim. I am just like <laughs> party girl, fun girl Annie, they called me, which yeah. I realized was an insult way later. Oh my God. I, I thought I was cool. I was like, aren't I fun? And looking back, I still was. I got to give myself this. And I'm sure you were too. It's like, 
we probably were little stars when we were partying. So. <laughs> How many times did you have somebody touch you on the arm and introduce you and be like, she's so crazy? Oh, uh, I still get it. They go, yeah. oh, Annie. And I'm like, I'm not like a wild dog. Yeah. <laughs> I always feel like people are treating me like I failed my obedience class. But, oh my God, yes. Like, don't want me to sit. I'm a grown up bitch. <laughs> I'm fun. I'm fun girl Annie. But yeah, we would just get so... And one time I called my brother. I called my brother, my twin, and I was like, oh my God, like, da da da. And he, I quit drinking when I was 25. He got married when he was 27 and had kids by 29. Yeah. yeah like, it's just like... <laughs> very different yeah. lives, yeah. And so, so he was okay. like... He, he said to me, he goes, Annie, it's Thursday. And I went, so it's hilarious. And he goes, we're not in college. He's mm-hmm. like, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, being awesome. He's like, dude, <laughs> mm-hmm. he was just like, this is not a good look. And I remember hearing that. And I always want my brother to love me. So that mm-hmm. kind of got in there. Sure. And sure. I had already, so this is when I had moved to New York. But I had been comedy. living in to pursue comedy, but I had been living in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So I graduated from high school at 16. And you said, No, I'm gonna stop drinking then. Yeah, I stopped drinking okay. then. Okay. Graduated high school, took a year off, did like service work, traveled in other countries and did different things. You and like, I did dolphin or something dolphin. Yeah, I trained dolphins. Trained dolphins. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I trained okay. dolphins, they're all dead. Every dolphin died. <laughs> Turns out you can't take them out of their natural habitat, they die. It was so funny. They sent me, it was called the Dolphin Institute. It was in Hawaii. Yeah. And you would get, I don't know if it was a monthly newsletter or yearly, but you would get the newsletters and they were always like, Kiapo, you know, did a backflip for the first time. You would hear all these like nice things. And then all of a sudden the newsletter would be like, okay, Kamai died of stomach cancer. And then it'd be like, yeah. Kiapo and the other three died from broken hearts. And you're like, why all of a sudden in a scientific community are we saying that dolphins died of broken hearts we took them from their natural habitat that's why they died mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but anyway a lot of good research was done we learned a lot <laughs> r.i.p hiapo okay Kamai, phoenix and Alayla. i remember all their names <laughs> oh i stand with a dolphin once her name was jenny oh jenny yeah. that's so funny they went a very different route naming their dolphin well it was in orlando so i think it makes sense okay. jenny is the hiapo of orlando <laughs> exactly it's the Alele. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I trained, I was really like searching for myself and I'm grateful that I had that year because it was, I did, I liked giving back, but I think I liked giving back because I felt like I was rotten. So I felt like I'd done all these bad things. So I had to now, obligated. I, to, I was going to be a special ed teacher, all of these things. And not that I didn't love working with kids with special needs. That was the job I got the summer I came back from Central America yeah. and from Hawaii. I became, I started working at a camp for kids with special needs. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And I want to start these organizations and do all this stuff. And when I was being really real with myself, even though I loved working with the kids, it was a sacrifice. It was me going, I don't deserve to do, you know, because I I wanted to be a comedian. I wanted to do something that was about me and attention on me. And I didn't feel like, I felt like I had to have a life of service because of all these horrible things I did. When really, I had been victimized a lot as a kid and just didn't really know how to process that. Mm -hmm. So, so I do all that and then I do the special ed stuff and then I end up going to college in New Mexico. I wanted to get away from Philly. So I go to college in New Mexico and my first semester, I don't drink. I was like, I want to get to know people. I don't want to lose control. I just knew how I drank and I was worried about it. Mm -hmm. And then it just progressively got crazy. So I was in Santa Fe for seven years. I was working as a bartender, a waitress, and I just... I was so bad at school. I was so bad at getting my work done. All the procrastination, I would wake up in the middle of the night with night terrors about not getting my work done Mm -hmm. and just feeling like such a piece of shit. And I just would drink. I was like, I can either do my work, which feels painful and confronting, or I can go drink. So I would just drink and drink and drink and drink. And I got my whole crew was drinkers. I just got, you know, I made sure I just was surrounded by, I was riding my motor scooter, scooter blackout drunk, which I, to this day, will say is my happy place. It's the most fun I've ever had in my life. Just blackout drunk, no helmet, driving a scooter. I don't recommend it, but I'm just saying. It's the joy of my life. It was a peak. <laughs> it was a peak. The wind through my hair. I mean, I honestly, I have a joke about it where I go, the wind through my hair, the gravel through my nipples. I, oh my I fucking crashed so bad. I crashed so bad. My drinking was so out of control. And I was fucking so many guys. Like, 
well, not so many. I don't want to make myself sound blown out over here. But um, I was, <laughs> your poor listeners, how old are they? These poor angels. But, uh, um, hopefully they're old enough now. And let's say 20. Yeah, I agree. you guys, you, you understand. But yeah. I, you know, I would sleep with any, like, I was so uncomfortable saying no and asserting my boundaries because that's such a self-esteem thing to say yes. no to someone yes, yes, saying yes. yes to yourself. And who am I to say yes to myself? Right. Oh my God. So uh, I'll let you have my body, mm-hmm. my body, which is essentially kind of what my parents were doing with me where they were like, and I don't think my parents ever knew I was in danger, but they put me in dangerous situations because it's like, it's that giving away, you know, that like, sure, I'll trust you or... Right you know, I'll do good, you know, writing some wrong, you know, my mom was adopted. I think a lot of it comes from that, you know, the, like core wound of, of abandonment. Right. But so anyway, so I wouldn't know how to set these, uh, these uh, boundaries up. So I ended up drinking kind of because I didn't want know how to say no to men. Yeah. So when men would hit on me, I would just get so drunk that either they would be good guys and not bang me or we bang, I wouldn't remember and Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about it and I don't have to be held accountable or reject anyone, which is crazy. I didn't want to reject. Oh my God. Oh my God. I totally get it. And why is rejection so bad? Being rejected helps you. It's good when you get rejected. Right. But But also the idea of like not, not taking accountability by just my, my big thing was always like, Oh, I was drunk. I don't remember. Like, okay, yeah. well, that make it okay. why are you saying that? You know, that was yeah. always my, the thing I'd say, my kids. Well, this, this guy asked me once, he goes, what do you miss the most about drinking? And I went, the excuse, the excuse was beautiful. Ooh. To just always be like, oh, sorry, I technically wasn't even there. I don't remember it. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. Right. I like moved all that over the camp. Yeah, you know the yeah, real, yeah. Real, watch Real World Road Rules when they would have no. the challenges? I know it's called The Challenge now, but I don't know they had is. like Real World Road Rules was like shows on MTV where oh, okay. they would take, it was like one of the first reality shows and they would get together and then they would do competitions or whatever. But I had been watching those shows for years. And when I was living in Santa Fe, everyone comes to shoot stuff in Santa Fe because they have some tax break or something. And they came to do a season of that. So I was seeing all of these old cast members that I'd seen for forever. And I thought it was so funny. I was like, I cannot believe everyone's here. So I got hammered, but I was a little bit sick. Mm. So I chugged, I wanted to party with them. So I chugged Dayquil and then was drinking like white Russians. I was just so fat. Oh God. Dude, I was so fat. I was drinking like the fattiest fat, fat, fat drink. <laughs> it was so funny. I was just, I got so bloated. I've now reached in quarantine back my Jaeger weight without having one drink, which is very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> but I ended up puking all over the cast of the real world the rules. Like I vomited <laughs> all over them and they weren't filming, unfortunately. It wasn't so funny. And then I ended up working for MTV. It's just like funny how everything Full turned out. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I would think it was so funny. I'm like, isn't this hilarious? I like vomited all over these people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, you God. know, I couldn't just like be sick at home and just like maybe miss out on one thing. You know, I was like, you can't get mad at me. I was so drunk. Just puking like green or um, sorry, orange fucking day quill over these poor people. Oh God, I puked in the back of two Ubers. It's $200 for anybody who might not know. So don't do it. <laughs> but uh, it was like just, I mean, the entire, like, I mean, so much vomit. It was insane. Were you day wow. drinking? It never got to day drinking. I mean, if I was going out with friends, <laughs> I guess at times, yeah. If I was going out with friends on the weekend for brunch, suddenly the mimosas would kick in and then I'd yeah. be, you know, 10 mimosas in. And also I had, I grew up Mormon. So that's like alcohol is wow. a huge no-no. Yeah. So then I had no idea of like, like I remember one girl mentioning to me, she was like somebody, just like a friend of a friend. And she was like, oh yeah, my mom always said like one drink, per hour and no more than three or like some sort of rule. And I was thinking like, I literally had three drinks in 10 minutes. What is- Yeah, who's only out for three hours too, by the way? (laughs) What are you talking about? I remember I would get my, I would get my bills. And so I worked at restaurants. So when I was in Santa Fe and at the height of my alcoholism, I was a bartender. So I was getting like bartender. Oh my God. Oh my God. And yeah. And then I was, you know, I would get to the full price after the 10, whatever, this kind of drinks. But I would wake up in the morning. I would have had, I would see my receipt. It would be 16 drinks. Like mm. how the fuck 
do you drink that many drinks? And I'm not exaggerating, 16 drinks. And I would just go until I couldn't drink anymore. Last call, I'd always be like, no, shots, shots. Yep. I would wake up. It. Oh, I always feel like I sound like I'm lying, but I would wake up so many times and my arms would be reaching out for alcohol. I would wake up with my arm out. <laughs> like, give me more. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just, it was like, I want to do this forever. And I do it like, I, I'm on and off of smoking weed. Like sometimes I smoke weed. It always becomes a problem. Then I have to quit smoking weed because what I do is I go from like, oh, what? this could be relaxing. I'll have a puff or two to being like, let's get the highest we've ever been. I'm it's always extremes. like, oh, yeah. the yeah. craziest thing. And it's, it's just so interesting. All of the, I listen to like therapy podcasts all day. I have these two podcasts I listen to every day, which are, Ooh, what are the you? Adult Chair with oh. Michelle Chalfant. She is absolute heaven. I always make these people have personal relationships with me, by the way, too. I stop <laughs> them. I'm like, I have a blue check mark. Do you care about me? <laughs> I love you. I mention you on every podcast. <laughs> I like need the personal attention. But um, so Michelle Chalfant, the adult chair, is just amazing. It, she just covers everything, and I recommend it to anyone who has you mentioned it in Rogan, and I have it pinned. Uh, I'm going to listen to the self esteem one yeah. later. Today. What's the other one? And then the other one is this guy Jim Fortin, and his is more about like brain science, and then his brother-in-law is a shaman. So it's spiritual stuff, brain science, and he used to be a hypnotherapist. So there's a lot of retraining your initial thought processes, like all the stories that you tell yourself that you've been telling yourself since you were a kid and breaking those patterns. It's so fun. That's the key, right? Yeah. Well, it's so exciting to realize we are our conditioned patterns, but that there are ways to work on it and to change and to get better. It's just so exciting. I just feel so grateful to be alive. It's just so cool to grow and learn and get over your shit. But I was, ta- oh, I was telling you before about breath work. So yeah. breath work, and I do it through my shaman, but there's a bunch of different breath works you can do. But a lot of these times I'll have these visions where I'm in the woods and my, my high school was in this really beautiful part of Philadelphia. And there were these beautiful woods next to the school. And I always go to the woods, those woods. And I always go to the woods. And I never really saw a problem with that until one of my visualizations, this wolf came up to me and goes, (laughs) this is on no drugs. This is literally, I hyperventilated into this experience. (laughs) This wolf comes up to me and goes, let's get out of here. Like, let's go to other woods. Like, let's not be here anymore. Like, it's time to go. Because I'm so, I've been so trapped in my own trauma. And I think that's where the forgiveness comes in. Mm. Where I realized if I didn't forgive my teacher, I was just dragging him around with me. Like every time I look in my reflection when I'm walking down the street, you know, into a bank window, there's this white dreaded guy behind me. Or I'm like in the mirror brushing my teeth and there's this dirty, tattooed, nasty guy behind me. You know, like I'm just dragging him with me through life. So that's when I was like, I need to forgive and just know that this is a flawed person. This is a sick person who has whatever his shit is. Another visualization I did, one of this was one Michelle Chalfant's uh, meditations. I can't remember which one it's called, but she has them all on her on her podcast. But one of them was like you go, you take an elevator down to a place, and I went back to that high school, the high school woods. And I got walked by my dog, my pup, my my dead dog, my little funky, my old dog walked me to, she's like, you know, a familiar person or or animal walks you to a rock. And it takes me to this rock outside. And I know the exact rock in in these woods. And they go, someone who hurt you is coming up. And I didn't think it was going to be my teacher. Like I wasn't Mm -hmm. going that deep. Mm -hmm. I thought it'd be maybe one of my parents or something, but it was my teacher. And then the, they had you play out this visualization where the person who hurt you apologizes and says, I'm so sorry. I was hurt and I put my stuff on you and I'm now taking that back. Mm. And I want you to know that I'm taking it back and it wasn't you essentially. And so things like that have just been really powerful for me because I could live in being pissed. I have an aunt who's still mad at my grandmother who died when I was like seven. Really? I could live, she's on Prozac, you know, and she's hilarious and she's cool. But, you know, she's paranoid about a lot of things and she's, you can, I think you have a choice in life and I see it in my friends who are getting older, my friends who are like hitting the fifties 
when you you can either bloom out, you can either crumble in or you can blossom out. Mm. And my parents blossom out, thank God. But I see a lot of my friends when they hit that age, like they go in and they go, they get old really fast rather than younger, you know? <laughs> Because you let go, it's like whether you're going to let go or hold on, I think, is the difference. So You know, it's it's weird that you say that because people who've seen me over the past few years comment on me looking younger than I looked six mm-hmm. years ago. And I I absolutely see it. Like when I see my reflection in the mirror, I look I was aging in a, at a different level because of holding on to all the pain yep. and the hurt and the trauma. I looked like, I actually looked like a different person. I think I look less angry now. I'm still dealing with the anger, but less of it. And I think that, I mean, it, it's so... It's so physical. It's wild. Yep. It's all inside us. That's what's so exciting. That's what all the work I've done in the ayahuasca taught me too, where I was like, I just took a thing and this is like inside me. My answers are inside me being told to me by a part of me. Like we have everything we need. We have all of the answers to all of the problems all inside ourselves. And it's just about giving ourselves the permission to access that and to let go. Because there's something that feels good about having anger, right? We're used to that. It feels like control. Yes. I'm mad. I yes. fuck that person, and it's adrenaline, and it's an extreme, and it's totally you know. the control thing. Uh, it's totally the control yeah. thing for me. It's just like, oh, I'm gonna hold on to this because blank. Yeah, but when you release it, it's like, oh, like we are all energy, right? So we can choose what type of energy we want to be, and we can work on that. And it's all about, you know, noticing the behaviors and just bringing yourself back to what you want, which is a life of happiness or, you know, or the, you know, to be your best self or, you know, to not be triggered or, you know, whatever those things are. And, and I just feel, I'm so glad I quit drinking because, and I, I quit drinking at 25. That's what I was going to say. So what, yeah. How did that, this was all around the time that you started or that you really committed to comedy. Had you already started it? It was the exact same time as starting comedy. So I had been drinking so much in Santa Fe and I knew I had had this dream of being a stand-up. Like I just had this little, it's like the pee at the bottom of the, the princess's mattresses. Like this little feeling, this like inkling. I was like, I think I could be really good at this thing I've never done. <laughs> you know, I was just like, hey, I think I got it. And, you know, maybe delusional, but I guess not delusional because I, I did end up being good at it. But, yeah. but I knew I wanted to do it. And it was the only thing that I'd ever really wanted to do and, and was believed in myself about. So I knew that and then, but I was embarrassed to admit it. It just seemed really cocky and weird and I was procrastinating on it. So I was drinking and drinking and drinking and still in Santa Fe and just getting super fucked up and sleeping with strangers. Well, I guess not strangers, a small town, sleeping with busboys, strangers, whatever you want to call them. Um, (laughs) I had an accident. I had my motor scooter and I crashed my motor scooter one night, just so fucking drunk. And I crashed it so bad and I woke up with my face split open and road rash all over my chest and really, really hurt and really could have died. I remember my friend Danny being like, you are on, you, this is a second chance for you. You, you, you could be dead. Like I have a, I have a sliding, sliding doors storyline where I am dead as shit. <laughs> and I think there's so many experiences. Like think about in France, like you could have gotten run over by a car. Like, Oh my God. Reckless, reckless. Anything can happen. Cause not only are you not there for yourself, but you don't have your, your equilibrium. You don't have your ability to speak. It's just so wild what we do to ourselves. Yep. For the, and you say it's for a party, but it's really to just escape, I think, to not deal with that trauma. 100%. So I crashed. I called my whole family. I was like, I have to, I need to go to rehab. I'm wasted. I'm fucked up. Like, I need help. And then in the morning, I had to call them all back and be like, hey, I was in a blackout. Disregard. <laughs> I don't really want to go to rehab. I'm fine. Mm-hmm. And my brother, my older brother was like, Annie, you said you would say that last night. Like, drunk me knew what you told me was going to do. Wow. But my brother was the only other one. My parents, you know, I think that they just didn't want to admit anything was wrong a lot of the time sure. because they would have to deal with all the stuff that happened. And your brother had already confronted you at this point. He'd already sent you that text of like, oh, it's Thursday. That well, had that was my older brother. So this oh, was gotcha. my Those older brother and my twin brother. I can't remember what my twin brother said, but my parents okay. were like, you don't need rehab for alcohol. You need rehab for life. Which I'm like, what are you talking about? 
But anyway, so I, I talked them out of it doing anything. And then I ended up going, you know, realizing I needed a change. So I was like, maybe I'll just move to New York. Cause I thought if I moved to LA, I would drink and drive. Mm. I thought it was a drinking and driving problem, which is so funny. I was like, I'm just bad when I, dr- when I drive. <laughs> I'm a nervous driver. I need liquid courage. <laughs> so I ended up, you know, I had these nine stitches in my face. I looked crazy. But I really, even though I kept drinking, I was like, all right, I need to make a change. It's time for me to move. So I moved to New York to do stand up. And then I was just drinking and not doing it. And when drinking in Santa Fe and drinking in New York was so different because New York had subways that I could fall into, mm-hmm. trains I could get run over by, stairwells I could fall down, like mm-hmm. more strangers, way, way, way more strangers. And I just didn't find people that were getting as fucked up as me. It just was like, ooh. So it started to look bad where I'm like the only sloppy one. And I had oh, some- God, problems. isn't that a shift? Once, you, once your mm-hmm. social group changes a bit and you're like, oh, fuck, now I'm, whoa, this I'm is the different. With the problem, which even my drunk friends in Santa Fe were like, we keep having nightmares, you died. <laughs> like everyone was just like, are you okay? I mean, once you have stitches all over your face, yeah, you can't, and I was wasted the night after I got in that car, that scooter wreck, I had the stitches in my face. I went out and got wasted the next night. And this guy had a puppy and I went over and pet the puppy and he goes, you don't remember me, do you? And I go, no, I've never met you. And he goes, I helped you last night when you crashed. Mm. Oh like, my I God. call your friend to come pick you up. He's like, I didn't want to call the cops because I knew you'd get in trouble. He's like, I ride a motorcycle, so I know. Isn't that crazy? I didn't even remember the guy. And then I was hammered again. That's crazy. But at least there was a catalyst for like a little bit of change. So then I went to New York and I was staying with my friends and I wasn't really getting anything done. And I was just drinking. And my friend finally was like, you need to do an open mic. Like, you want to do this, you need to do it. And she's like, I'll go with you. So she went with me to do an open mic. I was super drunk. I couldn't remember my jokes. I blacked out. You know, like I just like panicked, blacked out. And then I got off stage and I'd already quit drinking Jaeger. I was like, Jaeger is my problem. <laughs> so I'm sitting down at this bar and this comedian I didn't think was funny. I thought he was so unfunny and so annoying. He comes up <laughs> next to me. And you have to understand, this is my first time doing stand-up, but in my head, this is my career. This yeah. is what I'm on this earth. I'm like, there's no way I'm doing anything else. So I'm so hard on myself. I bomb and I'm like, this is the worst thing that could happen. And I'm sitting there slumped over at this bar, at this place called Cake Shop in the Lower East Side. And this guy that I don't think is funny comes next to me and he goes, you know, we all bomb sometimes. And I go like, you don't get it. Like, I'm going to make it. You know, I'm like, you're not, you're not like me. He's probably like, you fucking asshole. But I'm just like, whatever. And I just don't like him. And he's like, buy me drinks. And I go, dude, I have a drinking problem. Please stop buying me drinks. I can't say no to them, but I don't want, Mm. I don't want them. And then I'm doing shots of Jaeger and he's still buying me drinks. And I I thought I was kidding or something, but then I end up like, I hate this guy. And I wake up in Bushwick on his air mattress fully clothed the next day. It's snowing out. I look around his room and I'm like, I cannot believe I ended up here. I didn't want anything to do with this person. Mm. And I knew that if I were to come into comedy and just start sleeping with people or having like rumors, I just knew that that was going to deter my career and lose my life that I wanted. Sure. So I ended up after that just quitting drinking and I didn't even hook up with the guy, but it was like that bad. But I was just like, ooh. In his so, presence. Exactly. I was like, oh no. So then I quit drinking. I call my friend Tate, Tate Fletcher, who is, he's got a podcast and I don't even know what I would call him. He's like a motivational bodybuilding guy. He's a stunt double. (laughs) He does a lot of things. He owns a gym. He has a coffee company, Caveman Coffee, but he he does a lot of things. But he was, I used to wait on him when him and his friends would come after AA meetings. And so I knew the connection to that. So I called him. Oh, okay. I used to think he was annoying. I was like, oh, they're so annoying, sober pieces of shit. Right, right. <laughs> like, I'm coming to my restaurant. I don't have any alcohol sales. Like, <laughs> no, you know, I mean, I think they tipped, but I was just like, they're annoying. They want extra yeah. dressing, you know? <laughs> they keep saying I'm drunk. They keep judging my weight gain. I remember showing my ID to one of them and being like, Jesus, you gained. And I was so mad. God, yeah. That, I mean, yeah. you piece of shit. But then in my head, I'm like, it probably was, he probably was actually shocked. He was like, how in this amount of time did you gain that much weight? Like, it's called Jägermeister, deal with it. <laughs> but so I ended up calling him and he was like, he's like, go to meetings. He's, he, and he was like, just try it for 30 days. He was very chill about it. 
because I the idea of quitting drinking forever was so scary because drinking was like my number one thing. Mm-hmm. It was my entire life. It was if you know, it was my way to escape all these things I was avoiding. So it was my best friend. Mm. But I had all these scars on my face now and I had all these you know, I, I just wasn't, I had now, I now was jeopardizing this thing that I knew was my thing. So I was like, that's it. And I started going to meetings and then I went back to that open mic the next week and I came in late and the host was on stage and he goes, the next, he goes, well, when that girl comes in, we'll have to retell that story. And I look over and I see that that kid had just gotten off stage and I go, are you talking about me? I took my jacket off and I threw it on the ground. I go, are you talking about me? And everyone turned around and looked at me and we're like, <gasps> and I knew that that kid had said some shit about me. So I knew what he said. He went on stage and said that, because I had told him I was quitting drinking after yeah. that. He made some joke about how he was like my rock bottom and, and how, you know, he just made fun. And it was, and he told my story. It was just like, not okay. Oh. And then he lied and he said that, Ugh. He said I sucked his dick or something. There was something that didn't happen that he said. And I was like, no way. Oh my God. He, like, he alluded to that we hooked up and we didn't. So I was just like, I got on stage. I waited for my time. I got on stage and I was like, uh, you know, I've woken up on park benches in winter. I've woken up in swimsuits. I didn't know where I got them. I've woken up bleeding from my face. I never considered quitting drinking until I woke up on that guy's air mattress. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And I dropped the mic and then it was like, yes. it's all on, bitch. And so this thing that had kind of been embarrassing and felt like a thing against me actually fueled me to be even better. So I was like, oh my oh, God. I want to have this little rumor about me, like, fuck you. And that guy is still doing open mics. <laughs> so, and I've like had my own TV show. In the yes. But it's just like, it was just really like all of these things. And if I look back on my life and if I frame it correctly, everything like that is like a beautiful, it's like my Bieber moment, you know, mm. where Bieber's like, and they all told me I couldn't make it. I mean, he was 13 when he made it. So I don't know who was trying to tell real they couldn't, but you know what I mean? You're like, you have yeah. a million of those like, and you know, and I'll show them. It's, so it's cool. So it ended up being good. So I quit drinking after that for comedy and then it never came up again. It was hard for three months, you know, just because I couldn't sleep and I'd been drinking all day. And, and well, how were the meetings? Did you did you immediately mm-hmm. like them, or do you were like, "Ugh, this is well, weird." I dedicated myself to ninety, doing my ninety and ninety. Which, for people that don't know, sure. that's when you go to one meeting a day for the first ninety days. And I got into it. I had an addictive personality, so I definitely popped on into it. You know, I I I was going every day. And it was very, very helpful when I felt like I wanted to go drink to go to a meeting. I loved having that because they just had them all day, all over. Constantly, the sure. Sure. So I really liked that. But then all of a sudden my whole community, so I have like these two things going on where I'm waitressing, going to AA meetings, and then I'm going to open mics, which is the thing I want to do with my life. Mm-hmm. And I'm so driven by that, that I kind of didn't, I don't think I needed because it happened on the exact same day that I started my career, I ended my drinking career, <laughs> my yeah. career, career. I think it was easier for me because it just, it was like this, this thing I wanted more than anything else that I wasn't going to be stopped by. Right. So meetings, I liked them for a while, but then I started to feel, I had a sponsor who I quit smoking cigarettes. I'd been smoking cigarettes and I quit smoking cigarettes. And my sponsor goes, don't quit, keep smoking. And would say stuff like that. Or she would say like, oh, well, that's just your alcoholic brain. Or she would say things like, when I would tell her I was doing comedy, she told me she she used to be a, she wanted to be a fashion designer, but then she was a seamstress. She was a very successful seamstress for fashion week and stuff. But she goes, you know, I used to want to be a fashion designer, but now I realize I'm really happy being a seamstress. You know, like maybe that's what will happen with you. And I'm like, excuse me, bitch. Oh God. <laughs> I was Ugh. just like, I'm so funny. What are you talking about? Yeah. I like, yeah. Oh, I've, I've been funny this whole time. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, I love it. And I actually, I had a pilot with Comedy Central where that was the storyline where my pilot, like, my sponsor didn't think I was funny. I kept laughing. <laughs> of her. Like everyone else loved me except her. But it was such a funny projection. And I guess I started feeling projected on in the meetings because the meetings were very, a lot about, about God and praying to God and giving your will to God. And I just didn't have that relationship to God. Like the, the word God was triggering, twiggering to me. And I didn't (laughs) know what my relationship was with spirituality and religion and all that stuff. So I was just like, this God shit, what are you talking about? And um, I was like, I want to give my 
will up to God. Like, I just fucking quit drinking. I want to keep it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And, it's like you, you feel you're feeling empowered, and then it's like taking the power away. Type yeah, of thing. I don't want to give it to God. I totally understand what they mean now, but it right. took me so long to get what they meant. But my sponsor was like, you know, you don't have to pick God. It can be your higher power. Can be anyone or anything outside of yourself. So I picked. I decided that my higher power would be Shaquille O'Neal from Kazam when he dressed up like the genie. <laughs> um, which I know is hilarious. Like I was like, and I prayed to him. I was serious. Like I really picked him and I would pray to him. And and I I, just, I wasn't fucking around, but people would just come out at me. They're like, you're going to drink. You're not taking it seriously. And I'm like, yo, why are you like raining on my fun parade? I'm so fun. I just don't drink. Yeah, and there was a lot of that sort of stuff, and I, I started to feel a pressure where I I wasn't sure if I was staying sober for my fellowship for the for the friends that I'd met in AA or to try to impress them or stay a part of this club or not. Mm-hmm. So I decided, and it was making me feel like I wanted to drink. It was giving me like an authority I wanted to rebel against. Mm-hmm. The program. Oh my god. Oh no, yeah, totally. That's I, I didn't do AA. I did a, a type of therapy called DBT. It's a really focused on behaviors and you have oh to like God. define your target behaviors. Do you know it? I've heard of it. Yeah. Did you do group therapy too with it or just? I did. I did group therapy. So my initial target behaviors were the throwing up for bulimia and then mm-hmm. the alcohol because those were the two that's like, well, these have, we have to get these under control. Or you do, and I then the alcohol it. helps you throw up. You're like, isn't this a beautiful thing? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah, 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 totally. I don't even have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> But I had the same instinct toward AA because I, I considered going to AA, but I was like, well, I don't think I really struggle with that kind of authority and group think anything that feels in any way culty. And I see that how great it is for some people. I think it's amazing. But I just thought, ah, I think this is going to be, might be more harm than good for me. Yeah. So then I wound up doing, doing DBT, which I really liked. But I, another thing that I like about DBT is how it talks about building a life worth living, which sounds like what was happening with you in comedy, where you're like, no, this I care about more than anything. It makes it so much easier to let something that isn't serving you go when you feel like this is the thing that I have to do. And you have that life worth living. Right. If you don't have that, I mean, I think it's much harder, but it's it's so, it's so, so much easier when you have that. Right. And to have the clarity of mind to know what you want. Like, what are you here for? Like, we all have like some specific gift that we have that was either nurtured or not. Mm-hmm. But it's like you need to be able to sit with yourself to get to that. And sitting with yourself hurts when you've been told or you've been conditioned to think that who you are is bad. So ha- there's so many things that had to happen for me to get the sort of freedom that I have now. But all of the bad shit, like I, I just feel like it, it, I feel blessed. I'm like, thank God that weirdo jerked off on me. Like, thank God. But like, it's so weird. And being able to come to that place makes me be able to forgive and let go of that stuff. But I'm also just so glad that I found the ability to quit fucking drinking. Because if I, I would be nothing if I kept drinking, nothing, nothing. I, I, I do not believe I would be alive. And I'm not trying to be dramatic. I just do not believe that I would be alive. I had no self-worth. I had nothing. I had nothing to keep me, you know, there, well, obviously I had a little, but I had that little pee the princess in the pea at the bottom of it. But it, it really like, but all of those mattresses were just trauma, 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 trauma. And I think with the program a lot, they talk about alcohol as this disease, but I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that, Ooh. I think that it's, it's trauma repressed. And when they say, well, it's inherited yeah. through, you know, if your parents had it too, it's, I don't think that's blood inherited. I think that's, the behavior inherited. I think that's the trauma of having an alcoholic parent. And that, and what I like about that is a disease you have to take medicine for, right? A disease Mm -hmm. you have to take pills, you have to keep your heart pressure, your blood pressure down or whatever. With, with trauma and a trauma response, you can work on that. You can work on responding differently. You know, I think there's more hope in in realizing like internal control, like the yeah. mind controller inside you. And not that, I mean, AA has the saying, you know, um, I can't remember. <laughs> what is it? Like, forget what you can. Oh, um, and I have the strength. You can't. Something. Yeah. 
something, something, something. Yeah. The serenity prayer, whatever the serenity yeah. prayer is, which they do have all those messages in there. To yeah. me, I couldn't, the group thing, and also talking about alcohol all the time, because I don't think that alcohol was my problem. I think repression was my problem. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm going in and I'm, I'm sitting in these meetings and everyone's going, alcohol, alcohol, alcohol. And I'm like, dude, we just stopped doing that. Why are we? So now I'm like pretty much at a bar, just not drinking, but talking about it. That's how it felt to me. I'm sitting in a basement at a church and for some reason the fucking coffee is always bad and the cookies are stale. It's never good. I'm like, <laughs> this isn't it felt like an alternative to being in a bar. Like, the yeah. bar is better than this. Like I am going to, if this is the other option, I'm going to get the fuck out of this basement and I'm going to go take some shots, you know? So that's how I started to feel a little bit at risk there. And that's when I was like, I need to go off on my own. And I, I was accepting my 90 day coin. <laughs> I'm such a piece of shit. I'm such an asshole. Not a piece <laughs> of shit. That's negative self talk. But I'm wild. I went up to give my speech in front of everyone. This was like a really popular Brooklyn uh-huh. meeting. So everyone was like dressed really cool. And I, you know, I had my outfit on. So I got up and I was like, hey guys, I want to thank you for giving me this. And I just want to thank you all for all the time that you've given me. But it's, I am reaching the three month point, which is the longest I've ever been in a relationship so I do think it's time for us to take a break I like broke up with AA <laughs> and everyone was like you're gonna drink like everyone was like you're like people were so mad at me and I was like I don't think I am because I I, I it was like I was chasing the self-worth and the comedy was giving it to me yes so, fuck yeah and I wasn't yeah. I was bombing but it was like I I was like I know I'm gonna be good you had what you needed yeah so then, but what's funny is, luckily, this quarantine didn't happen early on for, the, for me to realize that, because I also had to break that where I wasn't putting everything onto comedy. Because then mm. if I put everything onto comedy, when comedy's taken away, which is happening now, mm-hmm. who am I? That's so interesting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And yeah. I, I've had no desire to drink, thank God, but it definitely has been, all right, who am I? What am I? What am I doing here? <laughs> you know? How have but, you been managing? I have, have, has it been a twiggling situation or have you been able to? It's been up and down, but I feel yeah. really good now. I'm so grateful for this. I didn't realize how much anxiety I had because I put all my shit onto comedy. Mm-hmm. So now I'm like, this has to go well. Every, every spot I was like, you know, I was deciding whether or not I was funny on each performance. Right. What is? It's like, I couldn't just like give myself like, bitch, you're funny. You were born you're a funny part. Like it's undeniable. Stop denying it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, just accept it. Just accept that you are good at what you do and that, yeah. And just like, if you have a bad set, it's just one set. It's nothing. So I think that I've, I've really worked on that. The breath work has just been beautiful. I mean, there, it's just, just I've never been drawn to breath work before, but you're making me want to do it. Um, I, I've always felt like I didn't understand it. It's a little, I don't know. I don't feel super connected to it, but now I'm it like... It seems ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. It, it does to me a little bit, yeah. It's also my ego. It's this thing that helps me so much. And my ego does everything it can to keep me from doing it. I did ah. a book with my shaman, which was... By the way, I understand how I sound when I say my shaman. Like, I want to <laughs> know. I know. I'm aware of how I sound. People are like, you're pretty all right. I'm like, my shaman says I'm perfect. Um... <laughs> But it's just very like it, it's. I just met this this being who is just yeah. so beautiful. But anyway, so he's just really like showed me a lot of stuff. And so it was twenty two days, I believe, of doing breath work once a day, and it was so hard. I would just wait till the last minute, and and then I feel amazing. And it's so funny to know that there's a thing that's going to make me feel great and still resist that because yeah. you're. Yeah. Your ego is, thinks it's protecting you. It thinks like, no, stay here. You're good. Stay right <laughs> here. It's fine. Stay little. Nobody can hurt you here. And it's like, no, be big, be bright. But so no. the breath work is, yeah, it's, he has a bunch of different ones that I've done. And I used to go to a breath work class at the den when we were allowed to go places. And now I'm like, breath work is literally the last thing we can do in a room full of people. <laughs> You get to, so the way my shaman explained it to me that really makes sense is you have all these things like deep down in your core that you were taught when you were so young that they're stuck. They're so ingrained in you. 
And when you do breath work, you get to that lower level and you can just, you like, you sift it, like you sift through it and it loosens it up and then it can come out Mm. and then you can get rid of it. And it really has gotten me to these really deep levels. I mean, it's unbelievable. I'll just be weeping at the end of it. Oh my God. You're just, you, and memories will come up from other times. Like I've had equally as trippy experiences doing breath work than I have actually doing ayahuasca. Wow. Yeah. It's Holy really shit. incredible. I can't believe it's just, it's just such a trip. It's just so exciting. And, and the quitting drinking was the catalyst for everything. I mean, I always tell people, I have so many people that reach out to me and say they quit drinking. And I'm so like, when I inspire people to quit drinking, I can't, yeah. I can't tell you how grateful I am to be like a person on this earth, being able to help people with that. Like, oh, like it just feels so good. And I just know what a gift it is to give to yourself, to, to let yourself feel the feelings and to get through them and to learn to just really at the core, love yourself and do what's good for yourself. It's just, whew, it's oh just. Oh my God, I have chills. <laughs> I know it's still going to cry. Such a door. That's so well said. <laughs> My God. You know, it was it was a little bit hard at first. And I always tell people it's just the life that you can have outside of this is so beautiful. Yeah. And when people relapse, I'm always like, don't be hard on yourself. Sometimes Sometimes you got to like, I have a lot of food allergies and so I'll cut them out of my diet and then I cheat and then my stomach hurts really bad. It's like, you kind of got to remember sometimes. Not that I think people should relapse, but sometimes you have to remember why you were there mm-hmm. and why you were doing a thing and just but go yeah. on yourself because people, I think you, it's that spiral of shame. And I'm sure you relate to this with eating disorders and stuff too. It's you do a, a behavior that you've deemed bad. And then you shame yourself for it. So then the yeah. only way to, to fill that void of shame is to do the bad thing again. It's yes, like the yes. dog, emotional. It's the dog. Oh my God. Such a loop. Yeah. But I'm just, you know, it's, it's just being, going easy on yourself. I do transcendental meditation twice a day. No kidding. Um, okay. Yeah. It's really cool. I, I did it. I kind of thought it was a scam forever ago because <laughs> and I was like, what is it? But I got drawn in because all the celebrities did it. So I was like, I guess. I got a paycheck and I was like, all right, I'll finally do this. I'm in, yeah. And I had a resistance to it because I was like, this, it feels elitist and snobby and I don't want to do that. And I had a resistance to it. And then during the quarantine, Bob Roth, one of the heads of it, has been leading them on Zoom. So you can do it with him. And he always goes, he has this like really quiet voice and he always goes, now we just want to think our mantra, just think it like lightly and delicately and when we start thinking other thoughts, we don't get mad at ourselves. We just kindly remind ourselves of the mantra. Like, it's so good. <laughs> just that whole, like, idea of just, like, everything is okay and everything that's happening is a lesson or it's unfolding something and just being easy on yourself. And trusting that, trusting the process yeah, of it all. Totally. We, we've gone way over. Do you have time for one final wrap-up question? Or you got to I have, like, I have to talk to you for... A million years. I'm yeah, going to yeah. my life now. I hope you know that. Oh my God. Oh, that's so nice. My face is so warm and happy. And like, well, I just really, I, I just, I just, from the little, I listened to your podcast, just even the description, we're just, we're on the same path. Oh God. I love it. I, I really like, I like what you're doing. Oh, thanks man. Yeah, of course. Same to you. I want to go back to the forgiveness thing, like where you're at with your parents now. It's fascinating to me how you can have the upbringing you had, the stories that you have, the the relationship that you had with them as a kid and now for it to be where it is now how was it you confronting them about that was it you saying like was there any point when you like when you just attacked them with anger and you were like I want an apology for all that you did or was it never confrontational how how is how is it where it is now I went through a phase and it was like right when Trump got elected, I got very twiggled. I was, you know, going to the women's march. I was like screaming. I was screaming at the march. I would be like yeah. screaming, you know? I was yeah. like, I'm so embarrassed. Honestly, I'm wearing the pussy hat still. I'm like, the, I'm telling you, the other side had to have made those hats. That could not have come from this, the side of the women's march. That had to have been a troll situation. The pussy hats that were pink, the pussy... Shaped hats? Uh, 
I, I, just, you know, I literally, I cringe when I think about it. I go, what? <laughs> no, what was this? I was on a bus. I was chanting. I was going crazy. Yeah. And then, um, and I was screaming at my parents and I just realized, like, I just, I know I started dating this guy who was like, who was definitely ended up being, he was, he's got some mental issues himself. Right. Sure. And he had been a good friend of mine and we dated and it was a very intense relationship, but it was the first time I'd had a man or anyone protect me. And, and, and I went, oh, I was supposed to be protected. Nobody fucking protected me. And I got filled with rage. Like, where were you? Just like so mad. My parents, they stayed on the phone. I mean, they, they have trouble apologizing. My, they can apologize to a point. But they can't apologize, and I and I, the work that I that I, um, the stage of my work that I'm in now is really seeing why they can't do that, and then dealing with why I need why I feel like I need them to say the words when I know what's going on, and I know that my parents love me, I know that they are proud of me, I know that they cherish me. But they fucked up. They didn't, they put me in a dangerous situation several times. I was running for my life. I mean, I didn't even get into like, I have like 20 stories like this. By the way, I'm writing a book. Um, Yay. Oh my God. I have like a million stories of like running for my life as a kid. And I was brought up in like a nice neighborhood, a nice, like the income bracket was not run for your life income bracket. But I found my way. But it, you know, and I just, I realized that they can't, if they were to admit what they did, I don't think they could handle it. I don't think they could handle what they did. Ah. Like, I think it would be too hard. It would just like their world would crumble. So they still have to have a little bit of protection up. Mm-hmm. And I understand that they, my parents are in the evening of life. My mom's 69, my dad's 79. And they're, they're having a good time. They're reflecting. They feel a little guilty. Like they'll come to me. My dad asked me the other day if there was any lesson I didn't get from him. Mm. and that kind of triggered me actually because we started talking about that. I was like, let's zoom about it so I can use it on my podcast. And then he didn't like say the things that I thought he was going to say. And then now I'm like, Uh, but what uh, I realized was the lesson, what what it was, was that I didn't get the lesson that I was good. I got the lesson that I was bad. So what my, what my goal now is, is to parent myself and to be to myself, to make sure that I get that message from myself, that I am good. My parents have done their job as my parents. I turned 18 quite a while ago. Like they, that part is done. And now it's, it's about love and it's about me. You know, it's about like, cause you know, they're in the evening of life and it's like my gift, I feel like is to be able to usher them in, usher them on. Like I want them to go to like, leave the world feeling so loved and, and good and happy. And, and they, they are because regardless of what they did, I am a successful comedian. I'm very, very happy. I work on myself every day. My twin brother is an Emmy award winning producer in sports television, his dream job. Mm. He's got a beautiful wife, two beautiful daughters. My older brother has a great job as a salesman, a beautiful, amazing wife. They have two beautiful sons. Like, oh. like whatever they fucked up, was perfect. It was perfect what they did. So I just have to like remember that. And I'm glad we're talking about this because I've had a little bit, I did get a little twiggled about my parents recently, but it's just, yeah. it's just to take the love and drop the other stuff, not take on their stuff. If they project shit on me, that's not mine. Mm. And just to like, like live in the love of it, lean into the light. Thank you, man. I can learn so much from you. <laughs> I can learn from you. So many good lessons. All right. We're good. We're done. All right, dude. So fun.